an upper boundary value simply, again, is a boundary value that is larger than every value of the adjacent bin. So this is how this works. I'm going to locate here <coughs> boundary values for our bins and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to keep track of them. So here we go. I'm going to abbreviate this LBV for lower boundary value and what's the other one going to be abbreviated as? What is it? UBV. Upper boundary value, okay? All right, you guys okay with that? So let's look at this and let's think about how, how we use this definition. You see the 5.5 here, right? See this 5.5? <coughs> it's a boundary value. Now, is that boundary value larger or smaller than every value in the first bin? Larger? How do you know? 5.5 is greater than what? then 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. Is that right? So 5.5, the boundary value, would be called a, called a what? Upper boundary value for which bin? The first bin. 5.5 is an upper boundary value for the first bin. All right, you guys okay with that? It's just simply the boundary value that's larger than every value that, that goes in that first bin. And notice this as well, because boundary values separate those bins, right? So this boundary value here, the same value, notice, isn't that smaller than every value in the second bin? 5.5 is smaller than 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So 5.5 is a what? Lower boundary value for which bin? The second bin. And the interesting part is that this pattern repeats itself in that 11.5 is larger than every value in the second bin, which makes it a what? Upper boundary value for which bin? Second. But 11.5 is smaller than every, boundary, every value in the what? The third bin. So that same value, 11.5, is a lower boundary value for the third bin, the same pattern repeats. So I can label them this way. 11.5, 11.5. What do you think I'm going to do next? How about 17.5? Isn't that larger than every value in the third bin? So it's an upper boundary value, but yet smaller than every value in the fourth bin? So it's a lower boundary value. Is that true? See what I'm saying? 17.5. 17.5, what's the next one? 23.5 and 23.5. Do you guys notice something interesting happening here? What was the bin width again? Six. You guys notice, what's the difference between these two numbers? The difference here and here. Here, well, it's the same numbers. So what's happening is the same exact thing. That bin width can be also be used to determine boundary values as well. In fact, what would you have if there were another bin? Right? If there was another bin, what would that boundary value be? Let's take 23.5 and add, what's the bin width? Would it be 29.5? Is that true? It would be 29.5, is that right? Now let's see if you're really awake. What would the lower boundary value be if there were a bin before the first bin? What do you think? 
if there were. There's not, there's not a bin there, so okay. But what would that, if there were, what would a boundary value be? How did you find that? You subtract 6 from what? From that. So this is going to be a negative 0 0.5. Maybe we'll put this in red too. A 29.5. Now you may say, but wait a minute, this is going to violate your definition of um, boundary values because you have to have adjacent bins. You're right. Um, but what we're going to do here is this. We're going to create what's known as histograms. It's a picture of data. I'm going to create a picture of data called a histogram. And the author of your book, Triola, what he does is he uses boundary values when he creates those histograms to represent your bins. So that's why we're going through all of this. And this is why I actually labeled these two here, because they're actually going to help us describe our bins okay, when we create our histograms. So you know, when you go do your homework and you're looking back at the book, you want to see what they have there. You want to see the same sort of thing. And it's only because Trillo uses boundary values when he, when he creates his histograms okay, that labels his bins. We'll talk more about that. But this is why. This is why we're looking at it. So if I gave you a table that looked like that, should you think you should be able to do that? Yes. That's the expectation. OK, you guys OK with that? Any questions so far? You sure? All right, let's see. A histogram. Let's talk about this. Picture of data. The first picture of data is going to be a histogram. Um, there's various pictures of data. I'm not going to go through all of them in, in great detail because of the fact that I'll have you read about some of them because we just don't have enough time to go over all these things in detail and you could read about it. A histogram. You guys know what that is? Did you guys ever see one before? Probably. They're around everywhere. That's known as a bar chart in a lot of circles. Microsoft calls it a bar chart. Right? What does it look like? No. Bar chart. It doesn't look like a rectangles here. A bunch of rectangles. That's a histogram. So let's do this. <coughs> this one we said was 29.5. And this is a negative 0 0.5. Let me draw a histogram for you guys. The reason, the reason I do it this way is because I'm actually creating for you a histogram without you even knowing it. Okay? Now, Jesus. You'll never know my parents are artists. You'll never guess. We're borrowing from algebra, although it's only borrowing because, as you guys know, if I take you know, your Cartesian coordinate system from algebra, the x and y axis, and then I just get rid of the negative, you may say, ah, this is what you have. x represents your data values. Your y is now your, your frequency axis. <coughs> Statistics borrows from algebra. But as you guys can see, there is a problem because negative values are to the left here. Is that right? So if you looked at that and you worried, oh my god, there's a negative value there. I understand. But those statisticians, they borrowed from algebra, all right? And they created your, your histogram this way. Not very consistent. But OK. That's OK. Is that right? We already know what they're talking about. So if this axis represents your frequency, you have various frequency values. Take a look at your data. You're going to draw these, these marks there on your frequency axis. You got 3, 5, 10, 4, and 2. Now, you don't want to draw like 10 marks because that's hard to read. You know, it's hard to see what the frequency is if you have that. And it looks cluttered up. And in the past, when people actually drew these things, there was a whole art to drawing a histogram. 